the business world is filled with acronyms. Some of the newest ones to show up are EX, CX, and VX. What the heck does it all mean? Is it another language? We're going to find out by talking to Debbie DeWitt, Marketing Communications Manager for Physics Incorporated. Hello, Debbie. Hi, Derek. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Excellent. Thank you, everybody out there, for listening to this episode of Digital Signage Done Right. This is Digital Signage Done Right. Whether you're new to digital signage or a seasoned pro, this podcast gives you practical advice about systems, communications, and content to better engage your audience. I'm Derek DeWitt, Communications Specialist for Physics. Welcome to Digital Signage Done Right. So in the business world today, we've got acronym a go go maybe acronym-itis. I know that EX stands for what? Employee experience. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And if you're looking for a definition, Gallup does a pretty good job with it. The employee experience is the journey an employee takes within your organization. The journey. It's a journey. That's, That's so nice. But really it is because it's not just within the organization, like the day they get there until they leave. It's actually every interaction they have with you along the way. So it could be the first email that you ever exchange with them about a job interview. Mm. It's the job interview itself. And then it's, you know, everything after they're hired, their role, their workspace, their manager, their coworkers, their well-being. Their onboarding. Yeah, it's it's everything. It's every day-to-day item. It all adds up to the employee experience. Up to and including when they finally get frustrated and quit. Or they retire lovingly with a gold watch and a big party. <laughs> because, you know, even when people leave your company, they can still be an advocate for your company. So that employee experience really has an effect throughout their life cycle. Hmm, that's true. Okay, so that's EX. What's CX? CX is the customer experience or client experience as we use it at Visix. And this is the same kind of thing. It's all of the interactions a customer has with your organization or your brand. Mm. So it's everything from the first time they ever hear of you all the way through the life of that relationship up through the present moment. So like if I come across a Facebook post that somebody shared, that's the first time I hear about your company, that's the beginning of my CX with that brand. If I'm watching a football game and I see the ad come up along the side of the field, that's my first experience. That's the beginning of it all. Yeah, it's that first impression and Mm. and what it does for them. And this is why branding is so important. So VX, um, vampires? Visitors. Ah, yeah, vampires would be cool, but uh, maybe that's another podcast. <laughs> the uh, vampire experience. <laughs> yes. Uh, the visitor experience, again, it, it's kind of like the customer experience, but it really encompasses just the tangible and intangible aspects of someone visiting your facility. So it's everything they experience mm. when they're on site at your place of business, your organization, your you know restaurant, your, whatever it your is. Your branch. Yeah. Like if you're a franchise or a bank or something like that. Yeah. Actually, with a bank, it could be down to the ATM. That's a visitor Mm. experience. They're Mm. visiting something from your company. Does that include like if you're a really big company like Coca-Cola based in Atlanta, uh, they have a museum devoted entirely to the history of their product and their brand? Yeah, absolutely. You're on Coca-Cola premises. That is a mm. visitor experience. It's it's a subset of the customer experience, but it's a visitor experience specifically for that museum. Hmm. This all seems like pretty fancy, modern, late 20th century, early 21st century talk. When did all this talk of experience really kick off? When did we start using this in the business world? Well, customer experience came first and the origins of it can be traced back to marketing and consumer theories back in the 1960s. It was in the 90s that concentration on making client relationships last became a priority. So Mm. the Mm. customer started taking center stage over the product because of course businesses figured out, you know, get a customer for life. It's much better than having to get that new sale every single time. You know, I'm reminded of what happened to the Hollywood studio film industry in the 1990s where they, they shifted to something quite similar which is they became obsessed with franchises we want we don't want to make one movie we want to make 13 movies right it wasn't about i just want to put out this one film it's about i want someone who's going to view our films for the next you know 12 years 20 years whatever and since they like star wars we'll use that one Mm -hmm. then let's make more star wars and we'll get those same people back and they'll pass it on as a legacy to their children 
Right. So there's a gentleman named Lou Carbone. Uh, he wrote a 1994 article called Engineering Customer Experiences. Mm. That was for a marketing management magazine. And that's sort of seen as the beginning of the customer experience discipline. Okay. So CX was first. Uh, what came next? Well, uh, visitor experience, because like I said, it's sort of a subset, if you will. The difference is that it's only when a person's in your venue. Mm. So, you know, this is like we talked about museums, hotels, other destinations that Movie may have. theaters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Disneyland, you know. Restaurants. Places that may have products, but they're really about the experience when people are there. Mm -hmm. And there was a 1990 book called Identity and the Museum Visitor Experience that mm. kind of kicked all this off. That was by an author named John Falk. Uh, so it really kind of evolved alongside customer experience. But it was focusing on how destinations are trying to affect how people perceive their facility and their time there. Mm, that makes sense. Because, you know, I may like a brand, but then I go into their place and things don't work. The sink is faulty. The soap dispenser doesn't dispense soap. Things like this, I would kind of say maybe having a bad opinion of that company or brand. Yeah, I mean, if you think about a grocery store, they have excellent products, you know, the checkout lines, the cashiers are friendly and all that, but we've seen that explosion. You look at something like a Whole Foods uh, uh, where yeah. there are experiences. And actually this goes back to, you know, starting to have, you know, a butcher or a bakery on site where you could actually go in and order a birthday cake. It's much more of an experience when you're there than just go in, grab something off the shelf and leave. So CX and VX kind of grew up together. What about the EX with the employees? Was that before or after? It's actually, again, at the same time. Mm. It kind of launched in 1990. But I'd rather go back for a second. There's actually a great article by Jacob Morgan that we're going to link to in our mm. show notes. So anybody who wants to get into the nitty gritty of this can go there. But he talks about that there's been a journey, an evolution of how we treat employees. So... <laughs> Up through the 1950s, companies were all about utility. Like, here's your stuff, do your job. Right, and be happy you have it. Right. So over the next couple of decades, they started looking at productivity mm. to counter competition and do better in the marketplace. And that was sort of like improving processes, your mm. workflows. So it was, here's better stuff to do your job. Yeah, and different ways to measure what success is in that job. Exactly. So it was the late 80s when companies finally started looking at employee engagement, which mm -hmm. we talk about a lot on here. Oh boy. Yeah. That employee engagement term is from a 1990 article. So again, we're in the 90s. Mm. Uh, William A. Kahn, where he looked at psychological conditions and personal engagement at work. So this is where people really started paying attention to it. And a lot of it was uh, came out of surveying employees. Uh, I, I think that's especially true in the tech industry because uh, those people are, their skill sets are so in demand. You got to hang on to them and it's not the salary that's going to do it. It's, it's more intangibles. Yeah, exactly. The tech companies are where we started seeing perks like foosball tables right. and free food and pets at work and a chef for the lunchroom. There was a lot more attention on sort of employee happiness and well-being at work, mm -hmm. but they found out just giving people stuff or perks didn't actually raise engagement that much. Mm. It was about culture and it's super fun to work here, but they realized they need to do more. I'm reminded of a story of Steve Jobs. Uh, when they kicked off Apple and started the uh, Apple headquarters. It's a huge campus. They had two professional chefs. They had uh, gyms. They had volleyball courts. They had all this stuff. And one day he saw an employee leaving. And he said, what are you doing? I'm going home. He said, exactly. He said, I'm, I'm going home. I pay rent on an apartment. I think I should visit it at least every couple of weeks. And Jobs was like, why? What do you have there that we don't have for you here? He didn't seem to get because he still maybe had this old fashioned idea of, hey, we're going to solve this issue with things instead of this more intangible experience aspect. Right. And I think I think that was actually a very valid effort to try and build a culture where, you know, it's the best place to be. And mm -hmm. you're you're so engaged in what they're doing. And it was so exciting at that time that I get where he wouldn't understand why you'd go home. Right. So that's why they needed to look at employee experience versus just engagement. Mm hmm. So as companies started looking at customer experience, obviously some bright-eyed person got the idea, can't bushy, we just apply this? Bushy-tailed <laughs> yeah. little worker squirrel. <laughs> right. Can we apply this to employees as well? I mean, let's look at that. And this, again, is about optimizing every interaction the employee has with the organization, the culture, the staff, and how they do their work. Mm. I also think of that as sort of the rise of HR. I know HR has always been around. It used to be called personnel. 
And I think it's somewhere in the 90s that that changes to human resources, which in some ways is less personal than personnel. And yet that's what you really started to see all of these kind of sometimes kooky initiatives coming out about getting people engaged and involved. Yeah, and actually HR has evolved. There are a lot of what we consider HR titles that no longer contain human resources. There are things like officer of people happiness, you know, staff (laughs) retention. Like there actually have been a lot of advances in that area as well. Smile manager. (laughs) That would be nice. I'd love to be a smile manager. But you're right. And and a lot of it is because uh, they started looking at things like happiness, well-being, culture, Mm. and it includes employee engagement, but it's not limited to that. It's meant to encompass more than that. Like, you know, do they have the right tools and technology they need to do the job? Are the workflows what we need them to be? You Mm. know, are our little standard operating procedures actually optimized for the people who have to do those jobs? Mm -hmm. You know, do they have the right workspace? Do they have the right work hours? Which is, you know, we know super important right now. Workspace and work hours is a big topic. Well, that's what you started to see in the 90s, really the rise of, uh, of daycare centers crash, for those of you who are British, on site in some larger organizations because they, they realized that this was an issue. Yeah, exactly. And right now we're, we're in the work from home transition, hybrid mm-hmm. office transition. So this is a big topic. And it actually, the, all of that bleeds into does the employee then actively support the mission and the culture wherever they're working from? You know, do they believe in the company? Do they Mm -hmm. trust it? You Mm -hmm. know, because again, just like you can create a customer advocate or cheerleader, you can do the same for an employee. You know, Mm -hmm. you get a happy employee. They're going to tell people that it's a great place to work. And that helps you with staff attraction and retention. It also helps you with your customer service Mm -hmm. and your customer's perception with the internet. We all know the cultures that are failing or that are looked at as, unpleasant by employees it hits the news so instead you can have employee advocates Mm -hmm. so that you don't have that bad PR and you know worse bad employee experience it's interesting because it almost seems to me I, I and perhaps I'm wrong because I wasn't alive back then but I have this idea in the 50s and 60s back when people got a job they very often thought this is it this is my career this is the company I work for I'm a fuller brush man I'm an Encyclopedia Britannica man. I'm a this advertising agency man. This is what I do, and they are where I get my sense of self-worth. That's where I can be promoted, and they're the ones that put food on my table, and so I'm loyal to them. And then somewhere in there, the boomers and then our generation, the Gen Xers, kind of went like, eh, it's kind of crap. We don't, we're not treated very well, and we don't really like it. And so they tried to find new ways to get that old loyalty that used to exist. Yeah, I, and I think there are a lot of economic and societal factors that bled into that. You know, you used to also be buying a house where you were settling down for the mm. rest of your life. You mm. wanted to work close to that. Now we're much more mobile mm. uh, with digital, you know, workplaces. We can work from anywhere without having to be right there. Mm. I think the recent stat I, I read, and I'll have to check this, but I believe it's like four years is the average. Yeah, it's uh, 4.4 years. Yeah, yeah. That's the average length of time that someone will stay at a job before they change employers. Yeah, and I think the difference between engagement and experience is really the breadth and depth of what a company does. You know, it's like you can just look at improving engagement, but if you go further than that, you're really looking at experience. It's a very subtle shift, but it's true because mm. engagement can be very temporary. You can do those perks that we talked about before. You know, you can bring in the food truck, you can have pizza parties, you can institute a casual Friday. That wears off. That's a temporary perk. The engagement will be temporary. Right. If day to day, I mean, I'll use a physical uh, object as a metaphor, but it, it applies to the other things that are far less physical and tangible. All that stuff's great, but if the chair I sit in every day, eight hours a day, hurts my back, I don't really care about your pizza party. I would like a new chair. Yeah, I mean, really, perks are just like a reward. Mm. I mean, we play games on our phones, and we talk about that it's annoying that they feel they need to give you like 16 rewards every time you (laughs) score. Good job. Excellent. Wow. Exactly. But, you know, it's a temporary endorphin rush or whatever. Mm. And when you look at experience, it's about every single aspect of your relationship with an employee and their relationship with you. Mm. You know, you're actually retooling your organization around employees. You're not Mm. looking at employees and going, well, we do things this way. Here's a cake or whatever. (laughs) You know, it's, hey, 
Sorry, you, diabetics. <laughs> yeah, you're like, what do you need? Let's design our workplace, our workflows around what you need to really fit in, adopt, and encourage our culture to be a part mm -hmm. of it, to be a brand advocate, and mm -hmm. to want to work here for the rest of your life. No company wants to hire new employees. No, it's I time mean, consuming and expensive. Yeah, I mean, you do want fresh blood. I mean, everybody knows you can't get totally static, but it is a process and very expensive and a risk every mm -hmm. time you bring someone new. Engagement is really like, hey, we're doing this. Mm. Do you like it? It can be a push. You can, you know, we've talked about a lot of tips to make it a dialogue versus push, but it is very much like, hey, we're doing this thing. Do you like it? What's your feedback on that? Versus, like I said, it's kind of a slight shift, but going into experience, it's every step of the way you're getting input. I don't mm -hmm. know about partnership because there are management duties that not every employee is going to understand or value, mm. but I think that they can certainly, when it impacts their experience, that's mm. the whole thing. It's mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. we're talking about your personal experience. That That's depending on job roles, personalities, all kinds of things. So mm. it's really getting down to the more individual level. Mm. Um, and when you're a huge corporation, that can certainly be a challenge, but you can do as much as you can do to try and hit all the notes you need to to improve that employee experience but I mean how much of this can you control really I mean you can control what you put out there and 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 I'm gonna switch into the whole experience conversation now whether it's a visitor experience customer experience employee experience you can absolutely control what you put out there you can measure its results you can see how people react you can get input on what you're going to do before you do it but here's the unfortunate thing is you can't control how people react to something I think we all know no, this. No, you can maybe, maybe with some degree of accuracy, predict how they might react, but no, you certainly can't control it. Exactly. So the thing to remember is it's personal. You know, it's subjective. It relies on how someone's going to perceive that experience with your organization, whether as a client, an employee, a visitor. But the main thing, and we've said this about engagement as well, and that's why they're so hand in hand. It's not a one-time thing. Mm. It is a process, not a task. You have to constantly, you know, get input, try something, see how people reacted to it, measure it, survey, tweak, adjust, do mm -hmm. it again. It's a relationship. Mm. I mean, experience is just another way to say relationship in this context. Mm. I think we all know, like we've all been told, you have to work at relationships. You know, you have to constantly be aware, constantly communicate, get input from all the parties and hopefully constantly improve it. Yeah, and the reason that uh, a particular segment of your target audience, customers, employees, visitors, reacts a certain way may change over time. So with the same stimulus, they may have a different reaction at a different time because they're operating from a different place. So it, ha it does have to be this ongoing, constantly looking at process. Yeah, I mean, we all know in terms of, for example, marketing or communications, one of the biggest demographics that makes a difference in how people perceive or interact with your brand is age. Mm, you know, and yeah, if yeah. you do get a, a client or an employee who stays with you for a very long time, they're going to have different reactions based on what age group and, and what they're going through in their lives. So we want to create positive experiences, however that gets measured and so on, in order to create loyalty. Is that basically what we're looking at? Yeah, it's a, a loyal client, a loyal visitor, a loyal employee. I mean, it's it's pretty basic. A positive experience leads to a more positive brand perception, whether from the inside or the outside. That leads to more revenue. And even if it's an employee, their service, their support, whatever they're doing for you improves. So that right, leads right. to more they get revenue. more efficient and yeah, sure. And then, like I said before, you create brand champions, mm -hmm. whether in or outside the organization. You know, especially when we talk about employee experience, that really affects every aspect of your business. Mm. Like I said before, attracting and retaining talent. People are going to look at your company and anything that's been said about working there before they take a job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously their experience when they're working there will determine if they stay or not. But, you know, whether they're efficient or productive, we've talked about engagement experiences, the same thing, that they'll be more productive. You know, you'll have less sick days, you'll have fewer people leaving, health and well-being increases. Um, you know, if you're doing product development, customer service, or even financial stuff, you know, just doing your job better. So that all leads to a better visitor experience or customer experience because your employers are happy. Well, I'm, uh, uh, we've talked about this before in this podcast and we'll probably talk about it again in the future. That great California cheese ad campaign happy of cows. happy cows make happy milk, which gets made into happy cheese. Right, which makes customers happy. Which makes customers happy. So if you shift your thinking from like sales, product sales, ticket sales, 
to experience, it's going to affect your whole organization. We've talked about this a lot. You've written a lot for us on it's human centered, Mm -hmm. which is a whole different aspect of thinking. Again, there'll be links in this to some articles for you. It can obviously be a differentiator when it comes to competition. I mean, that's for sure. Hey, those guys are stuck in the past. Welcome to now. Yeah. So it's a long term strategy uh, that will definitely have long term payoffs. Yeah, this is all super interesting stuff, and I could talk about this all day. And yet, the name of this podcast is Digital Signage Done Right. So what does this have to do with Digital Signage Debbie? (laughs) What's it got to do with putting stuff on my screens? Yeah. Yeah, well, we talk a lot about how digital signage is looked at as a technology. The IT person researches it, buys it, puts it in place. It's looked at as an IT solution, but it's really a communications tool. Like we've said this a million times, but I'm just going to say it again in case you're a first time listener. It is not a technology tool. It is a communications tool. That happens to be technological. Exactly. Exactly. So if you create this experience mindset, you know, to do that, you always have to put your audience, whether it be employees or customers or visitors or whoever, at the center of your communication strategy. So what's the experience I'm trying to create versus what message do I need to throw up on the screen? Right, right. What do I need to say? When does it need to show? Job done. Right. And and I get it. A lot of people are handling digital signage as a task, Mm -hmm. you know, especially if You're not creating the things. You're the manager who just schedules it. A bunch of people are just handing you disparate messages to throw up on screens. Mm. That can be a challenge, but again, if you're doing some training, if you're looking at it as a communications tool, you can actually help coach those people. And if you are the person creating content or campaigns, you can keep that experience in mind and Mm. think about Mm. how is the experience of seeing this, uh, engaging or interacting with the message, with that layout, with your interactive wayfinding, if someone's doing an interactive project, whatever you're showing, how might that affect the audience? It does come to design. It comes down to basic design principles. It needs to be easy to read, easy to understand, appealing, attractive. If it's interactive, just like a good website, the navigation has to be easy and intuitive. So that's all part of experience. You know, how might they think or feel about it? You know, and will it improve the experience you're trying to build for them? Because I would say if it doesn't, don't do it. You have to ask yourself, why am I doing this? Right, right, right. Just because we decided in committee, you know. Right. And, And information can be part of the experience itself. I know that I get the information I need on my digital signs. So even Mm -hmm. if it is disparate messages, if they can rely on those signs, those screens throughout your facility to get what they need, they're going to appreciate that. That's part of an experience as well. Sure. And like you said, design uh, is a huge factor in this, especially I think when it comes to things like interactive screens and signage. I personally have been to facilities that are run by, let's call them organizations or brands that I I thought I, I, I kind of respected. I was like, oh, I like this company. I, I think what they do is all right. But then I got a chance to play with their interactive screen and it was clunky, just a mess. It was very hard to read. You tap the things they didn't work half the time and I started kind of rethinking that company like wow maybe these guys are not as on the ball as I thought they were well we've all done that when you you love a brand or a company and you go and their website looks like it was designed in 1998 (laughs) you know you're like 640 by whatever it's all squished in the middle it's all that beautiful web blue web blue yeah Yeah. right you're like who was this an old geo city site that you just poured it over Right. And I will say, disclaimer, please do not dismiss any entire company because of a bad interactive project or something like that. That can be down to, you know, just poorly planned, poorly designed. It could be in the middle of being remade. Well, maybe you because don't know. they were rushed. Maybe they were like, look, I don't know. I just get it done. We just need to get it done. We have to engage our people. <laughs> Hopefully not. But yeah, when it comes to interactive, that's where uh, experience is huge because, you know, we know it engages more senses than just staring at a screen or look glancing at a screen. You know, you're actually having to navigate around. Like Mm -hmm, I say, I always think of those as very much like a website experience. But yeah, whatever you're doing, basically it's about thinking about how's this going to fit in with their overall experience. Yes, you do need to care about whether a message is effective or a campaign is effective. But this is taking it that step further and saying, Mm -hmm. what about our messaging as a whole, our communications as a whole? Is that adding to the employee experience, the client experience, the visitor experience? And it's going to affect everything that you do, the content you show, how you design it, when and where you schedule it. 
and how you measure that success. I was just thinking that it requires people who are responsible for communicating and branding and and basically improving the EX, CX, and VX of an organization. They need to start looking a little further down the road. Yes. Start anticipating, ah, this is, and then this leads to that, and mm-hmm, and this. So a, a lot of it really comes down to, I should think, refocusing and reprioritizing what it is that you're trying to achieve so that you can create this more sort of inclusive, in many ways, experience for the people who are interacting with your organization. Yeah, and digital signage is one communications tool. If you're looking at it, but it's a good one. <laughs> if you're looking at experience, uh, this isn't going to be a standalone effort. Your marketing people, your communications people, your human resources staff, your mm-hmm. management team, if employee experience or customer or visitor experience are important to the whole organization, that's going to permeate all of these things and they'll be done in concert. So this isn't all going to lay on the digital signage manager's shoulders. You know, right. you can get help for this. This is This is a corporate culture. This is a corporate focus. So don't silo. Maybe that old way of doing things where everything's siloed and, you know, in this office, this is what we do and we don't even know the other people in the other offices. Maybe those days are past us if we want to have a a holistic, comprehensive sort of a, a culture that bleeds out to the employees and from there to the world at large. We need to have that kind of looking further down the road, really expanding what it is that we focus on in order to integrate the organization and its brand and its message and its values values mission. and so on, mission and so on, into the larger fabric of people's lives. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of practical articles out there if you're trying to improve your visitor experience, customer experience, and especially employee experience. There are mm-hmm. a ton out there about that. So. I know that we're not getting into a ton of tips. I wanted to stick to the overall definitions, kind of introduce the topic Mm. and, you know, really just put it in a little bit of a framework for digital signage managers. But there's a lot out there on the web that you can go to if you want some practical tips. Though the letter X has often been used in the past to mean the unknown. When we're talking today about organizational communications in the 21st century, we are talking about EX, VX, and CX. Three things that are interrelated and somewhat similar to one another and that every organization should seriously spend quite a little bit of time focusing on and thinking about and implementing and, as Debbie mentioned, constantly evolving and changing. Yes, people plus experience. Those are the things. Those are the post-it notes to put above your desk. People and experience. The message is secondary to those two things. Right. Don't forget the letters before the X's in these three acronyms are customers, people, visitors, people, and employees, people. And we like people. Well, Debbie, I hope that you've really enjoyed your IX. Excuse me? Interviewee experience. Oh, but I have. Oh, on this PX podcast experience for all of you listeners. Thank you again for listening. Don't forget you can find a full transcript with links on the Visix website, go to resources podcasts. Thanks for talking to me today, Debbie. Thank you, Derek. And thank you for listening, everybody. Hey, want more free stuff? Then head to the resources section of physics.com for free masterclass guides, blogs, videos, and more to help you with your digital signs. Please share, subscribe, and leave a review of this episode and connect with us on social media. 